very fortunate today to have uh, Betsy Mason, uh, who is the author of All Over the Map, um, uh, uh, here in our midst, uh, speaking about uh, the maps in, in the book. Uh, we just had a chance to see about five of those from our collection, several, uh, many of those maps in the book are uh, from, uh, from the collection, and uh, we're at this point now where we're going to put those away. So, um, so uh, Betsy Mason is an award-winning science journalist who writes about everything from animal behavior to particle physics. She also writes about maps and has co-written a cartography blog at Wired, and National Geographic with Greg Miller for five years. So Greg Miller is uh, the uh, other author of the book, and she's going to be here in uh, April. Uh, actually, I think I think it's May as part of the California Map Society uh, meeting. Uh, it is April. It is April. So uh, Ma Mason and uh, Miller's new book, All Over the Map: A, a Cartographic Odyssey, uh, published by National Geographic. Uh, is a gorgeously illustrated collection of intriguing stories about maps, map makers, and cartography. It features more than 200 maps from all over the globe and throughout history, including the original maps uh, for Washington, D.C., 19th century maps of mural circuits, and the elusive schematics for the Death Star. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I have to mention that there are maps, uh, aside from um, the c maps at, at the David Ramsey uh, Map Center, uh, there are maps from the Banner Earth Sciences Library and Map Collections, uh, other maps, uh, all from Stanford, so it's not just uh, maps uh, that are here at the Center Earth, um, so it's just uh, qu quite wi wide ranging. Uh, Betsy will share the stories uh, behind several of her favorite maps in the book, including the ones I, uh, I just mentioned. And uh, lastly, I just want to say when we are done, uh, Betsy will be around um, to sign books. The books are for uh, uh, sale over here, so, so hang out, hang around after. Okay, thank you. With no further ado, Betsy. Is it on? It's on? It's on. Okay, great. Uh, so a cartographic odyssey, that's pretty much what I've been on for the past two years as I've been working on this book. It's uh, maps are pretty much all I've thought or talked about. I just ask my friends and family or, or really anyone I've met in the past two years. Uh, but as uh, Celine mentioned, my co-author and I are science journalists. And so this was a little bit of a departure, but we both really love maps. And when we were working together at Wired, we started the, the blog there. It was really an excuse to make maps part of our jobs as science journalists. And it worked better than we could have imagined. Uh, we ended up moving to National Geographic and then doing this book. So when people hear that I wrote this book, including my science journalist colleagues, but really lots of people, they often ask, why maps? Why do you love maps? And I guess I probably shouldn't have been surprised by that question. I was, but I was more surprised by the fact that I didn't seem to have a, a good answer for that. <laughs> sort of embarrassing given I just wrote a book about maps. So I started trying to think, you know, where did this obsession come from? Um, you know, I've always, definitely always been attracted to maps as long as I can remember. I spent a lot of time looking through road atlases of the United States when I was like, I just spend hours paging through the, well, actually, I still do that, so. Um, <laughs> But there we go. Uh, I think I really started to uh, fall in love with maps when I learned how to make geologic maps in college. Um, and that's because that's when I first started to really, it started to sink in that maps can do so much more than just be navigational aids or geographic references, that they can show you things that you wouldn't be able to see any other way. Geolo the geology beneath the landscape is one obvious example, but you know they can show you all sorts of abstract things, where poverty is concentrated in London, or where the best bets for solar or wind energy are in the world. Um, I'm pretty sure that, well, it's a chicken and egg thing, but it seems to me that the making maps in Geology 101 is part of the reason why I ended up majoring in geology, and then ended up here at Stanford to do my master's degree in uh, geology. You may recognize this map. This is one of the earliest geologic maps. This is um, William Smith's 1815 map of England and Wales. This is just one piece of it. And this copy is actually in the Branner Earth Sciences uh, Library and Map Collection. Um, 
also the subject of Simon Winchester's book, The Map That Changed the World. Another reason that I find it difficult to answer that question is that it just seems so obvious to me. Uh, what's not to like? <laughs> like this is, uh, I, you know, d are there, is there somebody who could see this map and not instantly love it? Uh, if so, I do not understand those people. Um, also, there's just so many reasons to love maps uh, that I would often end up trying to answer that question by explaining why I like one individual map and then an hour later they would really regret that they had asked me that question at all. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it really, it really depends on the map. Um, and so the book is filled, as Salim said, with 200 maps, all of which I love. Um, so it's always hard to decide which ones to talk about. But uh, when we were looking for maps for the book, we, we didn't just want maps that are beautiful to look at, they really are. Um, lots of beautiful maps in this book, but we also wanted maps that had something more to offer, a, a, a story behind them or some kind of story to tell. So there's 80 different stories in here about, about maps, about the people who make maps, about science, about culture, about history, about politics, about pretty much everything you can imagine. It turns out that maps are a really neat vehicle for just exploring everything, because everything is maps. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about some of my favorite maps in the book, and then I'm going to go into depth about um, three of the maps from the collection here that are in the book. What's first? There we go. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is a small piece of a 1977 map of the world ocean floors. It was made by geologist Marie Tharp and Bruce Hazen and painted by the Austrian painter Heinrich Baran. And this is clearly the best map of the ocean that will ever be made, right? I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Um, I have uh, another thing by Heinrich Baran in there. Does anybody recognize where this is? It's Yellowstone, actually. <laughs> it's kind of, it's sort of a weird angle on Yellowstone, but he did hone his, uh, his painting skills in the Alps, so the, you know, the, some of that carries over here, but this is looking south at the, across uh, Yellowstone Lake at the, um, the Tetons there. And Baran would take, uh, I don't want to say liberties, he would creatively distort his maps to show off the landscape and make it more understandable. Um, so, you know, some things are bigger than they actually are. And the Tetons actually, if you were looking at this angle, they would just, it would be dead on. So it'd be an unrecognizable blob. So he just rotated it 55 degrees so you could see it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a map of uh, Utah Beach in Normandy from World War II, um, and it's actually a three-dimensional terrain model. Uh, the first time I saw this at the Library of Congress, I was like, wow, what, what's that about? Um, this one, they didn't know a lot about it. They did know that it, this one had been used to brief D-Day planners on the ships while they were trying to figure out what to do about the bad weather that was coming. Uh, including Eisenhower. So I started looking into it, and it turns out that this was part of a huge secret effort where they mapped virtually every battlefield or place that they attacked by air in World War II, the Allies did. And really nobody knew about it then, and people seem to still not know about it. I didn't know about it. There are hundreds of these, very few have survived. This one, uh, and very few high resolution images of them have survived. That's <laughs> This is a, uh, a map of Kiel in Germany. This is a, a major port and naval um, station that was heavily bombed. And so it's hard to see here, but the, the detail on some of these maps was incredible. They had, you know, the, down to the color of the buildings and the, the widths of the roads and hedgerows and everything. And uh, if depending on the scale, some of them had actual little tiny boats in the harbor. And one of the model makers said that he had clipped hairs from his mustache to use as tiny little masts on the tiny little boats in the harbor. <laughs> so they were pretty serious about getting everything right. If they got things wrong, people could die. So they took it pretty seriously. Okay, this is easily one of my favorite maps. Well, I could probably, say, I'm gonna say that before every map I talk about here. <laughs> uh, but this one's been a favorite for a long, long time. This is a piece of one set of 15 maps that shows the old river channels of the Mississippi River over the past 6,000 years. I think it has 27 different channels. Uh, and the, the set goes from Cairo, Illinois, down to the Gulf, the entire lower Mississippi River Valley. 
And these were made in the 1940s by a geologist named Harold Fisk for the Army Corps of Engineers because they were trying to understand how the river works a little bit better in order to stop it from doing what it wants to do. Um, but these are pretty much buried in that report for five decades until the Army Corps eventually digitized them and put them online because they would occasionally get requests for these maps and there were very few copies of the report made because it's very expensive to print this many colors in the 1940s. Um, and then at some point, some cartographer, I still haven't figured out who, discovered these maps and the cartography community w went wild for them. These are sort of held up as you know, part of the cart cartographic canon these days. And one of the reasons that cartographers love this so much is that it does two things really well at the same time. It shows you the overall pattern and gives you a really good sense of how restless the river is and, and how much it has moved over time. And at the same time, it's got a ton of detail in there that's really easy to read and understand. So that's hard to do, uh, especially when you have this many colors. It kind of looks like spaghetti, but if you get in there, you can see a lot of things. This is a map that is designed to help aliens find us. <laughs> and that might sound, you know, fanciful, but a copy of this map is currently hurtling through interstellar space on Voyager 1 spacecraft 13 billion miles away from us. So uh, this was made by Frank Drake, an astronomer for the SETI Institute, um, who's also the author of the Drake Equation, which is what we use to figure out the likelihood of uh, life somewhere else in the universe. But he uh, was tasked to make a map that some sort of future intelligent being would be able to understand. And so he chose to use uh, things called pulsars, which are the leftover remnants of supernova explosions. And they're still spinning, and they have beams of light um, coming out of them. So as they spin, if you're looking at them through a uh, telescope, it looks like a pulse. And so that's why they're called pulsars. And each one has a very specific pattern of pulses. So these lines show the distance and direction that the pulsar is away from our solar system, and then this binary code describes the, uh, the signature pattern of that pulsar. And so here is a copy of the map on the cover of the Golden Record, which is on the Voyager spacecraft, and you may know a little bit about that. It's the collection of sounds and images that Carl Sagan put together to, to help the same aliens that you know, understand us a little bit better before they hunt us down. Uh, anybody recognize this place? Ah, I heard, I heard one right over there. Uh, don't feel bad if you didn't recognize it's Boston because Boston looks nothing like this anymore. This map is from 1775, and Boston is just this tiny little uh, peninsula there. I think I have a pointer I could use. Um, you know, connected by this narrow neck here that it was covered during high tide. Um, and everything else that exists in Boston today is artificial land. Um, so here is a, a page from the book that shows a map from 1806 where you can see the, the narrow neck. And then by 1841, you can see the neck has expanded quite a bit. And these, these little areas have also been filled in. Then 1878, you can see Back Bay starting to get filled in here. That's uh, 2018. And this map down here, if you, uh, some people might not be able to see it, shows the dark green is all the pre-existing natural land and the light green is all of the man-made land in Boston. So it's over 5,000 acres. It may be the city with the most artificial land. As you know, San Francisco would probably give it a run for its money. But we have not uh, cataloged it and measured it in quite as much detail as, as has been done in Boston. So I think it would probably win, but we don't know certainly recognize this place. Um, but it might be a little disorienting seeing your hometown with uh, Cyrillic text on it. This is a map that was made by the Soviet military during the Cold War. And it's part of one of the hugest cartographic efforts ever made. The military uh, mapped the entire world at about seven different scales, including some really creepily detailed maps of US cities. Um, and if you are interested in that, Greg will be talking the whole story behind these maps in April at the um, California Map Society meeting here. This is a map of how information flows through the human hippocampus. This was made by a 19th century neuroscientist from Spain named Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Um, he has 
did thousands of drawings. They're all amazing. If you, if you get a chance to, to look him up, you should. But um, he, he basically spent most of his career um, looking at neurons through the microscope. Uh, he'd take thin slices of brain of humans or other animals and stain them. And up to this point, the stains that they had for tissue would just stain everything. And so it was a little bit hard to see details in there. But another scientist, Camillo Golgi, had just invented a new stain that for reasons nobody understood would just stain some of the cells or neurons. So for the first time, they could see individual neurons and exactly how they were shaped. So Cajal uh, started drawing all of the ones that he could find. And he noticed that there were an incredible variety of sizes and shapes of neurons. Uh, but they all had one thing in common. They all had one big appendage going out one side, the axon, and then a, a nest of smaller appendages going out the other side, the dendrites. And when he mapped out the human retina, as you can see here, he noticed that the neurons had their dendrites pointed towards the photoreceptor cells, which is where they would be able to get information about the light that's hitting the, the eye. And then the axon would head towards the next layer of neurons and, and so on, and then the final layer would, the axons were heading out into the brain. So from, from this, he was able to then map all sorts of different neural circuits in the brain um, once he understood how information flows through neurons. Of course, this wouldn't be confirmed for another 50 years, but he was right. This is an actual map of the human retina. So the photoreceptor cells are up there, and you can see some of the arrows around it that show which way the information is flowing. Probably recognize this. Yeah, it's DC. It's not actually DC. This is a, a, a map that was made in 1902 as part of an effort to convince the government to pay for this to be DC. Um, at the time, the mall had sort of it was sort of dilapidated and there wasn't a real plan for it. And uh, a bunch of landscape architects and architects got together and they just said, this is, a, this is a disaster. We need to convince them to fix it. So they drew up all these plans for how it could look. And this painting in particular, made by a man named Francis Hoppin, helped convince the, um, the federal government that they should do this. And they for, they're still actually working on some aspects of this plan. It wasn't carried out entirely like this, but aspects of it are still um, in the city's plans. This is well, one of my favorite maps, big surprise. Uh, <laughs> probably recognize this, it's just a piece, so it's, yeah, it's the Grand Canyon. This is another uh, map that was a supplement for National Geographic in 1978, and it took eight years to make to measure the entire canyon, and then uh, all of the hand-drawn and hand-painted cartographic details so this, uh, again, is probably the, the most beautiful, best map that will ever be made of the Grand Canyon, in my opinion. You might be able to get a little bit ac more accurate with GPS, but you know, for, for what, for why? When you could, when you could have this. Um, I've actually given entire hour-long talks just about this map. That's how, <laughs> that's how amazing it is. Um, so I think that that brings us to, oh, this is the last map I'm gonna tell you about before we move on to the maps from this collection probably the weirdest map in the book. This is a map of an imaginary world that a man named Jerry Gretzinger has been creating for uh, 35 years. Actually, 35 of the last 55 years. He took a 20-year break when he had kids. But um, this is in 2012 when it was laid out in, at the Massachusetts uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in 2012. And uh, every one of these is an eight by 10 piece of paper. You might notice that that black dot is Jerry. So you can see how big it is. This is actually the last time that the map was laid out in its entirety. At this point, it's 2,500, uh, I think, panels. Now it's over 3,600 and it's more than 55 feet across. So it, it is exhibited often, but never in its entirety. So I spent a lot of time talking to Jerry about this map. Uh, trying to understand how he did it. And it started in 1963 when he was a college student. He had a super boring job in a ball bearing factory in Michigan. Uh, and so he started doodling on a piece of paper, sort of sketching out just a, a city grid looking thing. And when he filled that paper, still bored. So he went on to the next page and the next page and he pretty much never stopped. He took that map to Tunisia in the Peace Corps. He took it everywhere and just kept working on it. And at first, this is one of the older panels. At first, it looks pretty mappy. You can recognize a city grid and 
there's rural areas and rivers and things, but as time went on, the map gets a little more abstract. Uh, you can start to see some, some sort of weirder stuff going on down here, and it's clearly a coastline in the map, but um, starts to look a little bit more artistic. Uh, and here, even more recent, again, still map, but um, so in addition to adding to the outside of the map and making it big bigger, Jerry edits the, ins the existing panels of the map. So he will make a color, scan a color copy of each panel and then archive that and then work on the copy. And so there are multiple generations of this map. I think he has like four entire sets of the map at this point, um, which I can't even imagine how he keeps track of that. But I, I really wanted to understand why Jerry does the map, but I don't think Jerry understands that. So uh, then I just decided, well, maybe I'll just try to understand how he does the map because he's developed this whole system uh, of what to do to the map based on a deck of cards that he's put together. And so he, he'll, he'll pull a card and the number and uh, suit will tell you tell him which direction and how many panels over to go till he gets to the next one to work on. And then it will tell you what to do to the, or tell him what to do to the panel. So there's things like, you know, add new paint, add an airport, collage things into the map because he had started putting in pieces of his journal and of old letters. So there's lots of his life in the map too. Um, and so to give you an idea how a panel might evolve, this thing really wants to do his, Here's one panel over time. You can see it starts out pretty rural. Next panel over a tiny town called Penfold springs up. Penfold grows a little bit more, maybe gets a church. Here's Penfold growing a little bit more, and you might not be able to see it, but some, some uh, abstract paint and words start coming in here, something about a team of horses. Uh, just so many random things in there. Then Penfold grows even more, but you might notice that there's also a blank spot in the middle. And then the blank spot gets bigger in the next one. So one of the weirdest instructions on the cards is add a void. <laughs> or I think, I think the card actually says new void. Um, and so when he gets that, he just covers up some of that panel with white, blank space, it's gone. Um, of course, it's not really because he made a copy. Uh, and then if he gets that instruction when there's already a void, the void gets bigger. And the void can swallow entire cities. And that is actually, I think, what happened to Penfold um, eventually. <coughs> But uh, the only way to save a town from the void is to build defense walls. Of course, it's up to the cards whether the defense walls or the void wins. Here you can see a successful defense against this void that saved Iron Corn and Raysville. Oh, and if the, if, the, if the void gets big enough, stuff starts growing in there too. Um, so, <laughs> so in my quest to understand just even how he makes the map and understand the ma map itself, I thought if I talked to him just enough times and ask him enough questions, I'd understand how the map works and therefore a little bit about how his mind works. But every time I talked to him, which was many times, he would just casually mention that, oh, there's uh, the map has its own time scale. There's map time. And we're in like the year 7,000. Well, in some places, you know, but other panels are way back in who knows when. Um, and oh, when a void covers a neighborhood, the people who are living there, they go off and live in another dimension. About 70,000 people are living in extra dimensions in the map. There are three extra dimensions in the map. There's the void, there's the red dimension, there's a new one that just showed up called Black Ness. So I'm sure if I kept talking to him, there would be even more crazy details about it. Um, so this is the first map I'm gonna show from the collection. This is a uh, map of the burned area after the 1906 earthquake. And this is one of probably, I think, maybe three dozen maps that are in the book that are from uh, David Rumsey's collection, most of which are in the collection at the center here also. Um, and David has been encouraging us from the beginning when we first started writing about maps six years ago and sharing his collection with us. So we're very grateful for that. It would have been a lot harder to do this book without his collection. Um, so this map is from a very important report uh, that was made by scientists immediately after the 1906 earthquake. Um, the burned area here covers 500 blocks. I think 28,000 buildings were lost and more than 200,000 people were homeless. Um, but this report uh, led to half a dozen major scientific discoveries. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you about a couple of those. 
So the lead author of the report is Andrew Cowper Lawson, this guy with the crazy mustache over here. Uh, and geologists just refer to this report as the Lawson report after him. Um, he was teaching at Berkeley, well, which was just the University of California at the time. And uh, there are seven other main authors and a dozen other secondary authors, but two of the most prominent and important are John Casper Branner and Grove Carl Gilbert. And Branner is the same Branner that the um, wonderful Earth Sciences Library and Map Collection is named after, and he was also the second president of Stanford University and one of the founding faculty. And at this point in his life, the, the grower of amazing mutton chops. Uh, Gilbert, uh, who most geologists just call G.K. Gilbert, because that's wh what he is on his papers, another grower of prodigious facial hair, but also one of the giants of American geology. Uh, he was actually the first geologist on the Wheeler Survey, which created the uh, map that you see on the, on the window of um, Yosemite when you walk in. He was also on John Wesley Powell's survey in the Rockies. He was one of the first geologists to work for the USGS. And he was in particular a gifted interpreter of the landscape, which would be called geomorphology. And he just happened to randomly be in Berkeley when this earthquake struck. He was here studying the impact of hydraulic mining on the bay. And so we benefit greatly from that coincidence. Um, I think our understanding of that earthquake and earthquakes in general benefited quite a bit. But Gilbert was also really excited to be here. Um, this is probably one of my favorite quotes ever. Uh, he says, it is the natural and legitimate ambition of a properly constituted geologist to see a glacier, witness an eruption, and feel an earthquake. When, therefore, I was awakened in Berkeley on the 18th of April last by a tumult of motions and noises, it was with unalloyed pleasure that I became aware that a vigorous earthquake was in progress, which, you know, as a geologist, you, you have to love. The dot, 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 he explains how it's so much easier to see a, a glacier or a, a volcano erupt. Um, so he was thrilled, and like most of the uh, geologists in the area, hours after the quake, he got out into the field and started making observations. And so he took a lot of photos also. This is maybe one of the most famous ones. This is uh, a picture of the, the fault rupture, and that woman is uh, most likely uh, Alice Eastwood, almost certainly Alice Eastwood, um, the botanist, and uh, who Gilbert was in love with and uh, who he later planned to marry, but he died before that happened, just days short of his 75th birthday, very sad heart condition. But anyway, she is amazing. She uh, created the botany collection for the California Academy of Sciences and also managed to save a substantial amount of it from the fire after the earthquake. So there's this dramatic story of her like, the, the, it was a stone staircase up to the sixth floor, but that had crumbled entirely from the earthquake. So she had clawed her way up the, the metal railing. And she had developed a new system of categorizing the specimens. So because of that, she was able to get type specimens for almost everything that was in the collection. So it was very, very good work by her. Uh, this is another picture that he took. As people who live in the Bay Area, I hope you know a little bit about earthquakes. Um, but the San Andreas is a strike slip fault, which means that the two plates move past each other in a horizontal way. So the fault trace goes right through that, um, perpendicular to the fence right through there. So that is offset on two sides of two different plates, <coughs> the Pacific plate and the North America plate. And this one shows a 20-foot uh, offset of a road near Point Reyes Station. Um, so you, right there, it looks like there's a bend in the road that's actually just sliced. This is a, uh, this demonstrates one of the discoveries that um, Gilbert made. He noticed that a lot of the, the damage that the quake was doing to the landscape or changes that it was making was sort of accentuating existing topography. So he deduced that, well, there's probably past earthquakes that created this depression that this is now deepening. And you know the logical extension of that is that there will be more big earthquakes in the future. He was right about that. It's still coming. <laughs> and, uh, so while the geologists were out in the field, uh, a bunch of engineers were documenting in great detail the damage to structures in San Francisco. So they were recording everything, collapsed buildings, of course, but they also noting uh, you know, where bookcases fell over, if a milk pail fell over, which way the milk sloshed out of the pail, all these sorts of things. 
an incredible amount of, of data. And then from that, they mapped the relative severity of, or I guess they call it apparent intensity of the shock. So based on how bad the damage was, they mapped out where um, the earthquake was most intense. And the, the worst part were um, the gray areas, and you can see some up there on the, the upper right, a little bit down here. Um, and then the green is next. So that was all pretty severe damage. The pink and yellow, I don't know why they chose this color scheme. The pink and yellow is um, not quite as, as bad of damage. At the same time, geologists were mapping out the geology in far more detail than before. So the beige on this map is younger, less, consol less consolidated rock. So these are sediments that were laid down thousands of years ago but haven't quite formed hard, hard rock. And the yellow up there on the upper right is artificial land. Uh, the green and orange is all harder rock. And so when they compare these two maps, you probably already deduced what they figured out, they notice that there's a pretty good correlation between the uh, type of geology and the severity of the damage. So the worst damage in the gray over there on the, on the map on the right correlates with the artificial land. And the green bad damage there lines up pretty well with the beige uh, younger sediments here. So they saw that the softer the rock, the worse the damage. And unfortunately, and you know, artificial land was clearly the worst, um, San Franciscans did not heed this new discovery. They, they just built right back on those danger zones. And in fact, they built more danger zones by pushing all the debris from the burned part of San Francisco into the bay to create more land to build structures on. So. Yeah. Okay, this map is uh, the fauna and flora of the Pacific. It's made by a Mexican artist named Miguel Covarrubias. Um, it was made for the Golden Gate International Exposition in 1939, the San Francisco World's Fair. And this was kind of an a, a, a unusual piece for um, Covarrubias. He made six different uh, maps of the of different themes of the Pacific. The theme of the of the exposition was the Pacific, because he was best known for um, other kinds of work. Here he's actually in front of the map, so you can kind of get a, a sense of the scale. But he's even foreground, so the, the map's even bigger than it looks there. But he's better known for his caricatures of famous people that he did for a lot of American magazines like Vanity Fair. This is Greta Garbo. This is a bunch of different celebrities in Malibu in uh, 1933, I think. Um, so here is a map of the uh, expo. And this building right here, floating out in the water, that is Pacific House. That's where the, um, where the murals were. And this over here is the courtyard of Pacifica, the goddess Pacifica. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. This is a picture of Pacific House. And there was a lot of artwork in Pacific House, but almost all of it was map themed. So it's uh, really cool, obviously. Uh, <laughs> The centerpiece was this huge uh, relief fountain of the Pacific that was made by the Bolivian artist Antonio Sotomayor, who lived in San Francisco. And um, you can see Covarrubias' uh, fauna and flora, though, just the, the bottom of it. So this fountain, oh, I think I have a picture of him here. That's the artist making it. Uh, and here, here's the finished fountain while it was in Pacific House. But so like a lot of the buildings in a lot of the expos, it, these were temporary buildings. It was going to be torn down after. But their plan for this fountain was to move it into the courtyard of, the, of Pacifica. And so here is the courtyard. Oh, here's the courtyard, yeah. So that's an 80-foot statue of the, of the goddess. It was a focal point of the, of the fair. So here is the... Uh, the from above the courtyard, and there is the thing, uh, the um, fountain actually in place. And you can see they, they also saved some of the uh, statuary to put around it. So that stayed on Treasure Island for um, s several, until 1991, actually. And it was in pretty, it was well taken care of until maybe the 70s when it started to fall into disrepair. And so eventually, I mean, there were plans to. Um, to rescue it and move it in front of the Treasure Island Museum, which never happened. Uh, this is a picture taken just before the um, Army Corps dismantled it into 361 individual squares that probably totaled about 30 tons and put it into storage on Treasure Island with some of the statues. 
which is probably where it is today. So if, if there's any rich people here who love relief fountains, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so there's other artwork, uh, other maps that had similar bad fates. This, here's the fountain again. This is a really low res image, but this is the only image I could find of this stained glass window, which was made by an artist named um, Edgar Dorsey Taylor. This is another stained glass that he did for, I think, Herbert Hoover Middle School in San Jose. It's a WPA project. I don't know if anybody's <coughs> seen that, if it's still there. But this piece of artwork just sort of shows his style, what, the, what it might have looked like. There were also a bunch of maps by an artist named Heiler Heiler. Um, and he, he did maps of specific uh, Pacific countries. The stained glass and these maps disappeared. Never been seen again. This is actually uh, a mural that he did for the San Francisco Maritime Museum that's basically all over the museum, just to give you an idea of his style. Um, so Cova Rubius's murals uh, fared a little bit better. They were initially shipped to the Museum of Natural History in uh, New York, where they were on display for several years until they were put into storage. And then in the 1950s, I think, they were shipped back to San Francisco and put into storage on Treasure Island. And then they were, um, at some point, in the 80s or 90s, hung in the ferry uh, building. I don't know if anybody ever here ever saw these in the ferry building. Uh, but uh, the ferry building was going to undergo re renovation in 2001. And one of Cova Rubius's friends and biographers had noticed that these were in there and were not being protected from the renovation and were covered in grime and hadn't been taken care of the whole time they were in there. She made a stink, got enough press. Mexico was pissed. Mm -hmm. So they took them down and restored them and eventually set them on a tour of Mexico in 2008. And then they came back and went back into storage. Um, here are the other ones. Uh, these are all prints, like you saw back there, of an atlas that was made of the murals immediately after the expo. So there were two smaller ones, the dwellings and um, native means of transportation, and then the big ones, economy of the Pacific. This is really low resolution, but that's Cova Rubius in front of it in the Pacific House, so you can see how big these things really were. Um, this is Peoples of the Pacific, and here is another crappy photo of it in the ferry building just randomly in a stairwell, um, some dude who was also upset. He took a lot of pictures of them. Uh, and this is art forms of the Pacific Arena. And so uh, five of the paintings were hung in the ferry building, uh, not this one. And then when they went to uh, restore them, they did not have this one. This one disappeared. New York says they definitely sent all six. There's no record of whether or not they got back here, so could have disappeared a lot of different places, but has never been found, even though people have looked pretty hard. Um, but another crappy fit <laughs> photo, but this is the uh, fauna and flora hanging in the de Young Museum in San Francisco, where you can see it now. So this is sort of the one piece that has uh, a nice uh, life so far. There's talk of... Um, hanging the murals other places, but you need really big walls for that, so there's not, uh, not a lot of options. Okay, so this is the uh, last one of the maps that I'll talk about. This is a hand-drawn, hand-lettered map of North Africa, and here's a closer look at it, maybe. Yeah. Fuck. Fuck. Yeah, there we go. So this is a, an example of what's called a landform map, or uh, also known as a physiographic diagram. And this is a method where the symbols used to um, represent different landforms actually resemble the landforms. So the mountains look like mountains. You can kind of picture the sand in the deserts. And this these were drawn by uh, one of my favorite cartographers, Erwin Royce, as I <laughs> explained. And as he put it, the map appeals immediately to the average man. It suggests actual country and enables him to see the land instead of reading an abstract location diagram. It works on the imagination. Um, and so he really wanted to uh, codify the um, methods. Skip that pretty fast. I don't know why I can't work this real well. This is one of his better known maps of the United States. And you'll notice the, if you can see the um, legend down there, I'll show it a little bit. In a second. And here's a close up so you can get an idea of some of the 
the artistry of this. So he, um, he decided to make a, uh, a uniform system and he made 40 different symbols that were standardized. He had uh, a dozen different planes, I think three different types of s sand dunes, eight mountains. Um, here, is, here are some of those over there and you can see all the mountains are there. This is uh, the legend for the US map and he sort of laid them out in, um, you know, sort of roughly how they might be related to each other. But he was really good at drawing these sorts of landscapes and when he was teaching, he would often, from memory, draw entire cross sections of continents just on the chalkboard during class. And his students were so impressed with this that they finally convinced him to put some of these down on paper, which he did. He did, he made 17 of them in color on brown butcher paper and these are all in the Harvard map collection. So this one is from uh, Lubeck, Germany on the Baltic Sea through the Alps to Milan. This one's from Pittsburgh to the Atlantic. This one is across Central America um, and from uh, Santiago to uh, Buenos Aires, I think. And this is across, the bottom one is across Australia. So these are pretty amazing in person. Um, I got to see this one at the Harvard Map Museum. It's 15 feet long. So it's, it's hard, you know, they have to like lay it end on end tables and there can't be anything there. I mean, we were covering up other people's research while we were doing this. And they really don't like to bring them out because, you know, every time they unfurl them, probably a little bit more of the chalk comes off. At the time they had plans to um, to sort of protect, uh, restore them and protect them, but I don't know if they've done that yet. Here's a close up of, um, of the, the Andes, so you can see the kind of detail. I think they're really amazing. One other thing that um, Royce did that I really like is he made this projection, which he called the armadillo for obvious reasons. And uh, one of the things I really like about it is, you know, all projections distort some aspect of the map. Um, and this one does too, you can see, but because your mind sort of sees this as a three-dimensional structure, it, you know, kind of makes up for that, like you understand that this is actually bigger than, than it's being shown because you can understand how the distortion is. The one downside is that New Zealand, not there. So uh, some of the maps have a little pigtail with New Zealand on them that are made with this one. Um, so I think that actually is the last slide, maybe. Yeah, that's it. So happy to answer any questions about these maps, about making the book, about whatever you want to know about. I think Celine's going to run around with the microphone if anybody has questions. Thanks. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, questions for... Looking at the equator of the pictorial map from the exposition, what's happening along the equator? I don't know. <laughs> it looks like the equator's on fire. I do like how there, if you, I don't know if you noticed that some of the animals are interacting with the equator, like the sloth is hanging off the equator. Uh, it's very clever. The equator is not on fire in, on, in any of the others, so I haven't quite figured out what he was doing there. I may have misheard this, but I thought you said something about hydraulic engineering uh, having a good effect on water through the bay. No, he was just studying the impact of the hydraulic gold mining on the bay, which clearly but was not good. <laughs> not good, okay. <laughs> but I, I I'm not sure what, I haven't looked into the, um, the work that he was actually doing then because it was obviously interrupted by a major earthquake. More questions? Usually people have, the first question people, most people have is, is Jerry crazy? <laughs> and I always forget, so I've been meaning to add, you know, add that in. He's not crazy. He's a little odd, but um, wow. he's very, very nice to talk to. And I, I think, you know, a lot of people can sort of relate to some aspect of that sort of obsession. Maybe not. Maybe that's just me. Get one over here. Uh, thank you. Um, you don't call yourself a cartographer, um, but you have inspired a lot of cartographers uh, with this work. Uh, so that's cool. You could have <laughs> be considered to be, you're, you're making maps. Um, but I'm curious of just about your work process and your workspace and how you've been able to hold all these things in your mind to bring them together. And just, I'm just, I want an image of your office, basically. It's a, it's a, it's a wreck. 
it's a total nightmare. Um, actually, my, my significant other, Brian, was also a freelance journalist working at home in the same office with me for a while. And one half of the office is like super neat and bare desk, and I just have like stacks of maps and map books and just stuff laying all over and all over the walls. Um, you know, if you have a good system for keeping track of stuff, I'd love to hear about it because uh, I haven't really figured that out. I, you know, I have physical folders, I have digital folders, I have, you know, tabs. I have got, you know, all these different things for, you know, because I wrote 40 stories for this book, and yeah, it was hard to keep that all um, in my mind. And you know, I when I was, I actually as you know, interviewed you and several others about map. I, I interviewed professional cartographers and geographers about the maps they made when they were kids. And uh, some of them have managed to save some of these. So I did a post you can look it up on National Geographic. But a lot of them had this sort of moment that they remember where a teacher inspired them. And you know, that's when they became enamored with maps. And I started thinking, well, if I had just had the right teacher, if somebody had had me make a map when I was in, you know, in grade school, I obviously I'd be a cartographer now. Um, but around the same time that I was writing this story, my parents' basement flooded, <laughs> and I, I, I went up to help them, and we were rescuing stuff out of the basement and uh, uncovered a box of my schoolwork from third grade. And sure enough, there was a geography assignment in there with a hideous map. It's terrible. <laughs> It's like, I didn't even finish the ocean, and it has this crazy food alliteration theme, so it's like, there's Banana Bay, and Del Pickle Delta, and all this stuff. <laughs> I was like, really into the, and, oh, and there's a volcano, and you know, you would think vegetable volcano, is a veal volcano, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> so I was wrong, but, uh, but I didn't end up making maps part of my job in the end, anyway, as a, as a geologist and, and now as a journalist. So, uh, Betsy, okay. I, have a, I have a question for you. Um, you. Obviously, you and Greg worked together to make this happen. I'm just trying to get a sense of how you did and how you chose the maps that ended up in the book. And of course, there are for every one map that you chose, there's thousands, well, at least 10 or 15 more that could have <laughs> been in there. So I'd love to hear more. Oh, yeah. Um, there, were, there were a lot of, uh, I'll call them discussions. Um, we had disagreements about, for example, how many geologic maps is appropriate for the book. Um, I thought, you know, I managed to sneak quite a few in there. But, um, you know, Greg and I have worked together for 15 years on and on in different capacities and, and at Wired. So we work really well together. Um, and we have different tastes in maps. So that helps as we were, um, you know, when we decided we were going to maybe make a book, I was like, I'm not making it without like these four maps in it. There's no choice. I showed all four of those maps here. Um, and, you know, Greg similarly had some, and then we just started gathering more maps, and then we sort of came up with themes for the chapters, and we're trying to fill maps in there. We wanted to have a lot of geographic diversity. We wanted to have diversity over time. We wanted to have diversity of, you know, local detailed maps to big world maps. We wanted to have all that, so we were just sort of, you know, trying to fill holes at the end. But, yeah, we left out... We left out some maps that it hurts me to think about that I made a book without that map. But the one I'm thinking about was also a map of the Grand Canyon. So you know what are you going to do? <laughs> Greg said no, not two maps of the Grand Canyon. Blame him. <laughs> I love some of those maps. I've never seen anything like that. The landscape one. Oh yeah. Edged, you know, from beginning to end is like a journey. I'm just wondering what were your favorites in terms of evoking your imagination. Uh, what maps, what styles of maps were your favorite, kind of like you let you wander around in them? Uh, I find myself gravitating to sort of early to mid 20th century American cartography. Um, and some of that's probably that, that those maps are easy to get information about, and that's what the cartographers that I hang out with know a lot about. And it's sort of, you know, there was a, a lot of innovation in cartography going on in the States at that time. But I also really love the sort of frontier mapping of the Western United States at the end of the 19th century that they were doing on the, on the surveys and that Powell was doing. And that's where that other map of the Grand Canyon is from. So I, I, I really like imagining, you know, entering a new space and how did they, you know, with the, with the, the techniques they had, how did they capture that? Some of the maps are, are pretty impressive given given you know, what information they had from not covering all the ground. They didn't have any aerial photos or anything to make the map off of, so it's, uh, it's, it's, 
fun to imagine that. Yeah. How is how are computers and software affecting cartography now? Uh, in in a number of ways, I think there's good impacts and also maybe some sad impacts. But you know, for one thing, the the um, advent of uh, digital mapping and now especially these um, platforms that make it easy for somebody who's not a coder to be able to make maps has really opened up the possibility for much more different kinds of people to make maps and contribute that sort of thing. So that's really interesting. You get a lot of different kinds of ideas. Um, at the same time, I think like the, the uh, map of Everest that I showed in the beginning, that is a, uh, a map made by um, the Federal Swiss Topographical Office, also called Swiss Topo, and they um, hand drew all of those rock faces, and they developed this, um, you know, sort of method for doing that. It would take days to do just a one inch of of those cliff faces, and they have for decades been trying to come up with a way to, um, to you know, to do that digitally and. They feel like they have, and they do make them digitally now. If you get up close, they're not as good. They'll never be as good. Um, and like I said, I don't think there'll ever be a map as beautiful as that one of the Grand Canyon. There are very beautiful maps made of the Grand Canyon these days. One of the um, uh, cartographers for the National Park Service named Tom Patterson has made some really, really neat maps of the Grand Canyon with uh, digital shaded relief, and they're, they're quite beautiful. But even he would say that that, that map that I showed here is still the I think I, uh, I think he puts it the gold standard of Grand Canyon mapping. So I don't, you know, that map took eight years and probably a couple million dollars in in today's, uh, you know, who would do that now? They just they don't do that anymore, and you lose something. At the same time, we can map so many more things so much more easily that there's a lot more cartography. That's some of the ways I could go on and on. And on. Did you have a question? I think you said you now work for National Geographic, and they published this book. Yes, they right? published the book, and I do write about maps for them. I'm not employed by them. I'm a freelance journalist, but I write for them, yeah. Well, I've saved so many National Me Geographics <laughs> because of the maps yep. in part. Are they a great source? Will they continue to be a great source for maps in the future, or? They are, and if uh, unless Disney, who just bought National Geographic, decides to change something, they will be on into the future. And um, National Geographic has great cartographers who are still doing innovative things, you know, trying new ways to get uh, lots of different kinds of information and time scales and, and different things onto one paper map for those supplements. Um, they continue to do work that wins cartography awards, and it was really cool to be able to get an inside look into the cartography at National Geographic as we were working there, and they were very helpful and encouraging. Um, so that's been fun. I've been, you know, looking at the whole history of cartography at National Geographic uh, was important to the history of cartography. So yes, and I think that that will continue in the future. I don't know. Do you agree? <laughs> Thanks. This is exciting to see. I'm curious what the role of the 60s and 70s, uh, almost as an interpretive framework, plays perhaps in your cartographic interpretation. So Jerry Retzinger's artistic and creative mapping, um, but also maybe even in the Stanford um, geology department. I don't know if that plays a role. Does the 60s and 70s play an interpretive uh, lens in your thinking and in particular your choice of Jerry Retzinger's uh, mapping to include in this book? Uh, the first time I heard about Jerry's map, I was just, I just thought, whoa, that is insane. So, I mean, that's why Jerry's map, but I don't know. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I do, um, Greg had to reel me back on how many maps from that era were in the book. So I would say I, I am sort of attracted to maps from that era, from the 60s, 70s, and even 80s, sort of right before things started going digital. Um, I don't know why though. I do sort of compare other maps to maps from that time. Greg is much more into some of the super old maps than I am, so as you're reading the book, of course all the stories that you like the best I wrote. <laughs> um, but some of the ones, more of the ones about older maps he wrote, I wrote more about science. I wrote the one about neuroscience for some reason. 
even though he, oh, I say that because Greg is a neuroscientist before he was a journalist, <laughs> so, and you did not know that. No. <laughs> I'm curious about uh, gaps that you think exist. Either are there places or topics that you've never seen a map of that you always wish existed, or uh, taking a, there could be a different lens of the majority of our historical maps, right, are made uh, that we have are made by white men. You know, if you think about who, if other people were mapping, what would we have seen? Like, have you thought about the lenses that we don't see because of what is recorded, or what do you wish existed that that doesn't? Yeah, definitely. Like as I said, we were trying to you know have a lot of diversity of of maps, and so as we started to you know try to go beyond our sort of favorite areas. Um, and, and fill some of the holes, we'd say, you know, we do not have any maps of Africa so far, so let's go hunt down a map of <coughs> Africa, which is how we found um, Pritchard's Atlas, which turned out to have a really neat story behind it. Uh, and, you know, we discovered, by trying to fill those holes, we discovered maps that we wouldn't have found any other way, but we had a lot of trouble finding, say, um, South American cartographers. We have South American cartography um, we do have a, a, a conceptual map of the world that the Aztecs and, or possibly Mixtecs made. So, you know, we did manage to find, but some were a lot harder than others. And, you know, maybe that's because of what has been preserved, but some of it's because of the sort of dominance of Western cartographers once that system came around. And it does make you wonder, you know, you see maps like this one over here, much different view of the world that emphasizes different aspects of the world rather than really the geography, and that's really interesting to me. I sort of have gotten into, you know, the d distortion choices that uh, cartographers make. So, yeah, I do think about that. It's, um, you know, there's probably, there's a lot more out there I haven't discovered, so keep yeah. filling those holes. Uh, and, and to add, and these are areas that we are really interested uh, uh, here at the center. So, uh, the, the uh, Barry Lawrence Ruderman Conference that's ha happening in October, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Uh, the focus is gender and cartography, sexuality. Uh, we hope in two years' time it will be non-Western maps. So these are areas that we're really looking at. So, yeah. Other questions for Betsy? Okay. Oh. So wh which countries do you think have the best cartographers? <laughs> <laughs> United States, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, like I said, that's probably because that's what I know the best, and you know, it's easiest to find the stories. They're all in English, and uh, you know, the maps are easier to find. They're here. It depends on what you care about in maps. Do you care that they're beautiful? Do you care that they're accurate? Do you care that they are important to the world at that time? You know, there's, depending on what you are thinking about maps, there would be a different answer. Like I said, it depends on the map. I've told you what my biases are. Obviously, geologic maps are better than any maps. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely, not everyone agrees. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think I'm drawn more towards thematic and conceptual maps. Um, you know, maps that are mapping ideas and abstract things that you can't see more than I used to be. I don't know, but then, you know, then, then the, the next month I'm off on some other thing. There's just too many, too many maps. That probably did not answer your question at all, but that's the best <laughs> I could do. <laughs> other questions? Okay. Uh, on if you want to buy a book, I'm happy to sign yes, it. Yes, I was just going to say, I was just going to say, big round of applause. Thanks everyone Thank for you, coming. Betsy. I, I love talking about maps, so thanks for coming to listen yeah. to me.